Hello. From the Adorama Live Theater at the CBS Hudson Square Broadcast Center, welcome to Author Talks. I'm Pat Farnack, and I'm here with Karen Zucker, Karen with a C, right? Yes. C-A-R-E-N, Zucker, and John Donvan. And they've written uh, a book, it's out, been out for a while now, but it's out in paperback now called In a Different Key, The Story of Autism. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's our pleasure. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us. First of all, the title, great title. What were, were you thinking music when uh, We were thinking the metaphor the of music being, music being a sphere in which everybody sings, and in certain situations, everybody sings in the same key. They perform together, but sometimes somebody might sing out of key. And does that make that person not a singer? No, that just makes a person singing to a different key. And people with autism, is, we see them that way, that um, they're, they're part of us. They're here. They are, they are us. We are they. Um, sometimes some people, though, don't quite fit what's supposed to be the conventional behavior. And as we tell in our story, um, the way society has reacted to people, that is the sweep of our story, that sometimes society has been very cruel to people for being different. But in the long run, um, we've gotten better at that, and we're still getting better, though we still have a long way to go. So we can all sing, and we can all sing in our own keys. You both are journalists, and uh, there were special challenges uh, to bring the story to the screen at ABC News and also to the book. Tell me about how you both came to the story of autism. Well, I was a producer at ABC News, and John is still a correspondent. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a son who was diagnosed in 1996 with autism. And a few years after that, John and I decided to do some reporting on, on autism, because really there was nothing out there. We were the first network team to do any sort of reporting on autism. And we wanted to tell the stories that weren't being told at all, and that were the real things, not some spectacular cure or some, mm. some silver bu bullet. But you remember what happened when we started trying to pitch the stories? Yeah, yeah, they, they were n totally uninterested. And you'd say autism and it'd be artistic. Yeah. I mean, we could not get our pieces on the evening news at the beginning. And we got Nightline to do a half hour special. And it was the first special ever done on um, a form of uh, treatment that is now state of the art. Mm. And about seven years into it, um, and we had done, we, we had started a series, Echoes of Autism, um, and we still do stories on autism today, mostly on uh, PBS. We've been doing a series, and we just had a piece there yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, but we thought we needed to do something more, you know, enduring, and, you know, hence the book, which took... Um, Too long. <laughs> very long time. <laughs> but so good. So Thank worth you. it. Thank yeah. you. And John, you have a connection to autism as well. My wife was born in Israel. He was a physician here in the U.S., grew up in Israel with a brother a year and a half younger than her who was very, very profoundly autistic. And he, uh, by that I mean that he um, really cannot live or function independently in life. He needs round-the-clock care and he doesn't use language very profoundly. And I realized uh, after meeting my wife and she was telling me about her childhood, how different her childhood was from mine, where there was no disability of this nature in my home. And, I, and she really communicated, got hammered home to me how people who, whose homes are shaped by that sort of disability are really in a different world from everybody else. They're isolated very often uh, and misunderstood. And I began to get interested in autism as, almost as a way as I'm, of understanding where my wife came from. Now, you did uh, the book in an interesting way. You started with the first autistic child in America or what you're calling the first art, uh, a man by the name of Donald Triplett from Forest, Mississippi. Tell me how that came about. How'd you find him? Well, well, first we were, you know, we were trying to track down. We knew, we knew yeah. that he was case one, the first child mm -hmm. ever diagnosed. Because he's him. in the medical, medical literature mm -hmm. listed that way, but not, not his full name, just his first name, oh. Donald. And we knew his name, and we knew his last name began with a T, and both John and I were simultaneously reporting on it. And John had made some connections and started to put the pieces together where he might be in Forest. And I was going through the phone book, calling all the T's. <laughs> and uh, one day, I, I called one of the, the T's, and a person answered the phone and said, Hello, happy spring, and have a wonderful fall, <laughs> and happy 2007. And I knew, you know, we had definitely nailed it. And I called John, <laughs> and I said, We got it. We, this is Donald. But then the next step was, what do we do? And well, to make sure, too. You know, we didn't really right. know. So 
Uh, Pretty sure. Um, <laughs> so we approached different people who, as intermediaries, we didn't just want to knock on his door. And we said, we're journalists, we're from New York, uh, we're interested in, in talking to Donald, is, do you, does he fit this description? And everybody said, they more or less confirmed that Donald was a very different kind of person in the community, whether they knew about his having this diagnosis or not. But they also said something else that was really interesting to us. They warned us that if we messed with Donald, that they would track us down, you <laughs> Yankees, and get us. And they were serious. Wow. And it was our first our f first sense of what was really going on down there, which is that Donald had been embraced as a part of their community his whole life. And we think that's part of what makes Donald special and mm. what makes Forest Mississippi so special. And what we also found was, so what happened to the first child ever diagnosed with autism? And that's interesting because in the medical literature, which describes this boy in the 1930s who could not use language in an obviously functional way and who was not connected to his parents, he didn't cry for his mother or he didn't respond to his father's voice or coming home from work and he didn't, he, he was obsessed with objects and he needed everything to be the same and if you moved the furniture he would have tantrums. You know, the classic, he, he became the classic model on which the first diagnosis of autism was really framed. What happened to him? Well, it turns out this elderly man we met has had not only the protection of his community, but within that protection, this great life. He, he learned to speak and he got, went further. He went to high school and then he went to college. He did it late. He graduated from high school when he was about 21, but then he went to junior college and he went to college and then he got a job in a bank and he just kept going. And when we met him, here was the guy who was at that point in his mid seventies, driving his own car, playing golf every day, having friends, living on his own, and most remarkably, traveling around the world all the time. He, it's his hobby, is, is travel. And so many times a year, he gets on a plane and he goes somewhere. And he, in a, again, he still has autism. It's in the way he speaks, but he does speak. And it's in the way he travels, because he only goes someplace for six days, and he takes pictures, and then he comes home, and he puts... He's at church. He needs to be at church on Sunday. Yeah, and he puts the pictures in albums, and he numbers them, and numbers are very important to him, which is often uh, the case for, uh, for, for some people on the autism spectrum. And so that's... He's got a great life. It's turned out really well. And he what, wasn't bullied in high school or well, anything? Well, that's what, or, we, that, that's what amazing. makes Donald's situation unique, is his parents, his mother's family, owned mm -hmm. the local bank. Mm -hmm. And when you own the local bank, you have a lot of clout. And we think that, not the money per se, but the fact that he wasn't bullied and that he was accepted and that because his parents owned the local bank, he was able to get a job there. Unlike adults with autism right now, it's so hard to get a job. And then if you make a mistake, you're out. Mm -hmm. But what happened with Donald is Donald was able to go to work and if he didn't do something right, he could try another job. One, yeah. one of his early jobs was being a teller, and he would, people would walk into the bank and say hello, and he'd say, hi, number 43467, and that would be his account, and you have $432 left in your account. So that job didn't last very long. But he got to make mistakes. I mean, and there are all these wonderful stories about Donald in the book and how the community helped him, and I think they all learned from each other. The thing everybody told us was, do you know he's a genius? As, and, and again, mm. we're talking now, we were interviewing people who knew him as a boy, so he's in his 70s, they're all in their 70s, now they're in their 80s. And they all said, he's a genius. And we said, what do you mean? And they go, well, when he was in school, he was always doing calculations. And in fact, Donald can do very quick mathematical calculations in his head. He had a habit of giving numbers to everybody he ever met. He would just randomly say, you know, there's a woman in town named Janelle Brown. She's now 70. I remember the day when Donald walked up to me and said, Janelle Brown, from now on, your number is 1,044. <laughs> and we went back to Donald after talking to a bunch of people. They all remembered their numbers from 60 years ago. <laughs> Donald remembered them all, too. Wow. But then the amazing thing, Every, the story that everybody wanted us to know was about the day Donald counted the bricks on the side of the high school building just by looking at it. Legend. It's a legend. <laughs> and, uh, and the story goes that one day he, he walked out of this high school building, this huge, massive red brick building, and some boys surrounded him and said, Donald, you're so good with numbers. How many bricks are in the side of the building? And the story goes that he looked over his shoulder, and then he looked back after a few seconds, and he tossed out the number, and everybody was amazed, and they ran off. <laughs> And the story spread for decades and through, part, through a, a stretch of Mississippi because we heard it in other towns. Oh, you're doing, just, that's right. Do you know that kid counted the high school, the bricks in the high school back in the 1950s? So it's, and, and that's where this, this pressure, cherishing him as a genius kind of comes from. 
But the Sometimes. story the story has a different ending than we would have thought, yeah. which is, um, you know, we've become friend, close with the family, and we've been down there a lot. And one time I said to Donald, you know, so, so how did you do it? You know, how did you figure out how many numbers oh. there were, how many bricks there yeah. were? And he looked at me, and he said, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> I, I made it up. <gasps> wow. <laughs> <laughs> what and, are your numbers, and, by and the then, way? And then, but then I asked him why, and he oh. said, "I wanted the boys to like me." So it's so so telling that um, it's we, introspective, we, we, though, too. Yeah, yeah, very mm -hmm. introspective. It tells you a lot about autism, yeah. I think, actually. And I'm five forty nine. Five forty and you're five fifty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm younger. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about uh, your paperback version of In a Different Key, the story of autism with John Donvan, ABC News, and PBS now, I guess, and Karen Zucker. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the autism spectrum. Uh, that's a n takeaway from your book. Um, I guess it's hard to tell when somebody is autistic isn't it still to this day it's always been hard to tell and and here's an interesting thing we had to work through working on the book when we started out researching we thought that when people use the word autism in one place they meant the same thing when they use it in another place and when they used it in 1950 they meant the same thing as they meant as when they used the term in 2004 and it turns out that autism is a very very shape-shifting concept uh, and it and everybody over the years has had a different definition for it and the reason that's possible is that autism is not something that has a biological marker you can't do a blood test or a cheek swab it's based on observing a person's behaviors and then interpreting those behaviors in light of a working definition so there's subjectivity in interpreting the behaviors and then there's subjectivity in well what's your definition and the definition has changed many many times so we're living now in a time where the definition is very expansive very very expensive so larger than it's ever been before and people who are included in it now um, some of you would not recognize at all um, because they're they're so smart and they're able they're so capable in so many ways um, they could have their degree a PhD in you know marketing yeah. but be bagging groceries because of their social deficits but that same person has the same diagnose as somebody who's like my brother in law yeah. autistic yeah. and who could be banging their head against a wall and who will need 24 7 support for their whole life. And, and we, adult diapers and help eating and things like that. And we those call two, those all, yeah. sorry. We, well, <laughs> we have a habit after seven years of working together, you notice that we really tend to finish each almost, other's sentences. Yeah, yes. yeah so. like that. So, um, uh, so the spectrum idea sort of started developing more in the 80s and 90s. So many, many more people are counted as having autism today than would have been in the past. And most of the people we describe in our book, most of that time they were very, very profoundly impaired. Um, and there's a good, very good side to the spectrum idea is that it's bringing into the conversation people who are very impressive people and that helps to destigmatize uh, autism. On the other hand, it, it's the source of a lot of arguments about what do we mean by autism? Who should be getting support? Uh, sh should we even be trying to cure it or should we be trying to celebrate it? So there are a lot of tensions that result from this difficulty in figuring out what it is actually we mean when we say autism. What do we know about the research that is being done into the causes of, of autism? Do we know anything? Do we know where the research is going? In what direction? Is it genetic? Is it environmental? All of the above? Well, we know for sure that it's genetic, and we've known that for a long time. And we also believe there's an environmental component, but we scientists haven't nailed it yet. Um, it's it's a ongo it's sort of an ongoing process, and there is no answer right now, no definitive answer. They're seeing things and they're learning things about girls because they're focusing on girls now in a way that they hadn't before. And they may they're starting to see that perhaps it's a different type of autism. Um, that girls have and why they're so un they're diagnosed. But there, are, there, are, there are people who say we will never know, oh. um, and let's focus on other things like how we're going to support people who need help. And that's another one of the tensions um, yeah. that the 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 presentation of people is so different that we may be talking about we may be talking about hundreds of different actual syndromes. And we're calling it autism, but it may be many many different things that just kind of look the same. 
Um, you know, it's often said that if you, when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, yeah. which is a way of saying it's it's kind of all over the place. And in a way, you know, some people argue, well, trying to figure out what causes autism is like trying to figure out what causes human, being a human, that it, it may be that complex, and it, or it may not be. So, but there's still, people are still working at this. I mean, they're still mm -hmm. trying to to say what, what, what is the cause, and the idea that there's the cause is, is kind mm. of... And it's autism favorite. families that actually brought the science into the autism world, because mm. there wasn't any science before, these, or very, very minimal amount of science before two families in the 90s started scientific organizations. Mm -hmm. And so the science is very deliberate and very expansive now, much more so than it's ever been. Now, everybody mentions this, the vaccine connection, and that has been debunked. I even remember interviewing uh, Dr. Andrew Wakefield back in when he first came out with the uh, vaccine connection mm -hmm. uh, before it was debunked. Um, but uh, a lot of people seem to want to grasp onto that because it could be a cause and maybe there's an answer. Do you still get that or questions about it? Absolutely. We hear the question all the time. Yeah. Um, are what we decided to do in the book is to see is to go with what the science says, mm -hmm. um, and and we think the preponderance of the science is pretty clear that the question had not been looked at very closely when Dr. Wakefield raised it to an, almost 20 years ago, and then it was looked at closely as a result of the alarm, and the uh, the epidemiological studies that asked the basic question as the as um, more children are vaccinated more often. Does the rate of autism across the population go up? The answer appears to be no. Um, that's a different question from can an individual kid be hurt by a vaccine in such a way that it causes autism? That's more of, a, uh, of an open question. We do know that, that vaccines do cause, have adverse reactions of all kinds in people. But the broad question that was raised 15, 20 years ago was, um, is there an autism epidemic that's taking place now because of vaccines? That's been put to rest. Except that it hasn't, because people are still looking, you know, you have a child who is diagnosed and all of a sudden, it's called regressive autism actually, um, your normal, what, what you perceive as your normal child who's speaking loses speech mm -hmm. and, and begins to be autistic. Yeah. And it's, it's almost comforting to have something to, to yeah. Mm -hmm. But infuriating too, because you, the anger right. at... Sure. Yourself at the pharmaceutical companies, at the government for school systems but it's an for answer. acquiring it, and but so it's an people, answer. So it's something that you can fight back against, um, and I think that that's part of what fuels it. it it's also when we talk about this in our book that um, the vaccine theory, for for all of its negative components, really brought autism to the forefront um, because people were afraid, and it was the first time autism mattered to somebody outside of the autism community, but, outside yeah, of yeah, somebody who yeah. was affected by it. It's yeah. why you did an interview 15 yes. years ago, because mm -hmm. is this something we need to worry about? Became like, in a kind of backwards way, the most, uh, the most effective awareness raising autism yes. campaign there ever was, fear. Is it common for a baby to be born uh, without autistic signs and then develop it suddenly yeah. at, at around age I guess six months to 18 months is around 18 months can... is where this is that regressive mm -hmm. autism Karen was talking yes. about it's when we say common yes within the conversation about kids who later are diagnosed the, the impression that the kid was doing fine and then yeah. went backwards is, is not at all unheard of it's it's relatively frequent it's relatively common um, now, what we don't, is, well, but what we don't know is, is <laughs> were, were earlier signs being missed? You know, yeah. what, was it more subtle? Did we not know what to look for? So, so that's another question that comes in the conversation. And if you have language, my my child always had language, and he was, and he was my first child. I didn't know what children, you know, what infants and babies were like, and he was, you know, reading at one and a half, and he had language, and, you know, we just said, oh, okay, he, you know, kind of goes to another different drummer, but um, it was much more than that, and we didn't know that actually until he was in a social situation and that's when you that's when you can tell so you might not see the signs because what are the signs when you're a first-time parent especially of autism they're so subtle especially in babies you guys are, are 
terrific. You're media darlings. And <laughs> uh, anything that you would like to talk about with regard to the documentary you're working on, uh, which is an offshoot, I guess, of a different key in a different key? Yeah, we're excited about that. We're, we're working on a trailer right now um, to look back at the history. Donald will be, you know, a star feature in it. Um, <laughs> what we really want to show, and we didn't talk there very much about this, yeah. is that um, Donald's story was his 75 year long story is such a happy story the last chapter of the book is called a happy man it's his life now but people who have the condition the diagnosis were really treated abusively for a long long time and as i said at the beginning we've come a long way in that and we tell a lot of those stories in the book people are institutionalized for life and they were given bizarre treatments painful treatments and um they couldn't go to school they, they were denied access to public school and in, in the film, what we want to make the point is that what happened in Donald's world was, is something that we, would, we wish we could bottle and put out everywhere yes. because there is, when it comes to adults with autism, they're still not being treated very well. We're, we've come a long way with the kids who couldn't go to school, now they yeah. can, and now they're in movies and things like that. But with adults, we're still not, we still haven't like, turned that corner to full compassion. And the film's point is, and Karen will be starring in it as a mother who's trying <laughs> to find a place in the world for her son where he'll be safe even after she's gone and kind of the point of the movie is that she found that this little town in Mississippi kind of figured out how to do it a long time ago and so it's a combination of Karen's stories searching for a place in the world for her son and finding that place in the past and trying to bring it forward. Well, that's a wonderful story, and thank you very much for being here to tell us about it and for writing the book and the documentary and everything else you've done. We thanks, so Pat. appreciate it. So much. Yeah, thanks for okay. having us, Pat. We've been talking to John Donvin, ABC and PBS, and Karen Zucker about In a Different Key, A Story of Autism.